If you could please stand for the reading of God's Word. Today we will be reading from Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 8. And after, after six days, Jesus took, them with, took with him Peter and James and John and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to, him, to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them, but Jesus only. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you, Brian. Good morning. Man, the, the, the people just keep coming in, and we got a somewhat full crowd upstairs. Thank you for being here today. I'm glad you're here today. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad that we've we finally made it to the Transfiguration. I've been looking forward to this. You know, the last several sermons were one, one verse, one verse, one verse, and then now we're also about halfway through Mark now, so it's an exciting, an exciting time. Transfigured, tr- transformed, metamorphosis, metamorphized. These are the various ways you could translate here in the English, tra- in the English tra- uh, history, language history, Generally, we, we do uh, translate transfigured. I think either of the other two words are just as good, transformed. This isn't a wish list or a laundry list, transfigured, transformed, metamorphized. This isn't tide gets you clean. This is what Christ does. This is how Christ shows himself. This is also what Christ does in you by his presence. This is also what Christ does in you by his presence. Do not be conformed to the world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. But we sometimes think to ourselves, I've got to change. I've got to change. Have you ever felt that way? Do you feel that way? Do you feel that way maybe when you were 16 or 18 or 22 or 25, you were starting to think about what you needed to do with the rest of your life. I got a secret. You've got time, you know. Everything doesn't have to be settled by age 25, right? But we think, I've got to change. I've got to change. I've got to become an adult. I've got to find out what interests me. I've got to find a career. I've got to find out who I am, what I'm supposed to be doing Sometimes we think, I've got to change, but the secret is to let Jesus change you. The secret is to let Jesus change you. Let God change you. Don't try to force the change on yourself. So whether you're 18 or 25 or 40 or 60 or 80 or 90 or 100, the principle still hold, holds. It makes no difference. All meaningful change within us comes from God and his word. Be patient. He hasn't forgotten about you. I had some um, brilliant friends in my younger days who were trying to make it in Hollywood or modeling. Boy, did they change. Some of them really knew how to transform their appearance You wouldn't know it was the same person from one day to the next based on how they dressed. There was this one friend who had a great sense of style. Like many sophisticated people, she was transformed by her clothes and her accessories. She really knew how to accessorize golden necklaces and intricate bracelets and Chic handbags, Italian designer bags that communicated power and radiate confidence. 
The accessories, they had a life of their own, and wearing them, she became a whole different person. Like Audrey Hepburn became a different person in pearls, the very picture of elegance. The power to transform through fashion is amazing. But all of this is on the outside. All of this is on the outside. Jesus transforms us on the inside by his resurrection power. He changes us from death and the world to life and the kingdom. He transforms you on the inside. He changes you from death and the world to life and the kingdom. He became, Jesus became, as 1 Corinthians 15 says, a life-giving spirit. Today, through the scriptures, we get to see who Jesus really is. God the Son, the giver of life. And by seeing who he is and how he is transformed, we can also begin to understand how he can and will change us. Let's pray. Lord, there's change outside of us. This is, a, this is reality. It's a transient world. It's a fallen world. It's a corrupt world, a world in bondage, a world under sin, under the curse. And as a result of this, there's degradation, there's corruption. And we try to compensate for that by changing things on the outside of us, by, by making adjustments on the outside. But the true change comes from you within, and it's a change from death to life. It's a change of heart by God's grace, by the operations of the Holy Spirit, it's a change of attitude as we look at the cross and the resurrection of Christ. And it's a change of atmospheres as we breathe kingdom air and walk in the kingdom. Help us then to see how profound the change wrought in us by Christ and his spirit is. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you that Jesus was transformed in the scriptures before our very eyes. Help us to learn today, Lord. Help me to learn. Help us together to learn. We thank you for this, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Right now, people believe this is, many people believe this. I don't know if you believe this, but many people believe or might believe this is the worst time ever to be a Christian in the United States of America. Wrong. Wrong. Let your thinking be transformed not conformed. This is the worst time ever not to be a Christian in the United States of America. This is the worst time ever not to be a Christian in the United States of America. Can you imagine falling into all of this stuff that people are doing today? The most outlandish beliefs imaginable. If you imported these beliefs from the moon you still couldn't really understand where they're coming from. So just thank God every day that you're a Christian. Thank God every day that you're saved, that you believe, and that you're a Christian, that you have the word of God, that God has given you his word, and that you can come to church, that you can come to church in the United States of America. Because except by God's grace... Except by God's grace, there go you, me, and Uncle Sam up the river. Do not be conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Our sermon today is on Mark 9, 2 to 8. And if you'll look up here, we'll see the title together. Our title today is God the Son as He Really Is. God the Son as He Really Is. And point one, we have four points today. Hopefully it won't be a longer sermon because we have communion at the end. But point, point one is transfiguration, verses two to three. Point two is Elijah and Moses. Point three is Peter's response. Point four is God the Father's voice, Jesus is our Lord. Again, our title 
God the Son as he really is. Let's see Jesus as he really is in the kingdom. We think about Jesus generally from the point of view of an earth man transfigured. When we look at this verse, we think of an earth man transfigured. That's one way to look at it. In fact, he is God the Son from heaven, fully God and fully man. The transfiguration shows us, shows us Jesus when he's not, quote-unquote, dressing down, so to speak, as he is without the veil, as he appears as king, as he really is as king in the kingdom. Did anybody ever read Mark Twain growing up? Nobody? You got to give me a break here. These are, these, are, these are some of the greatest books, not only in Western civilization, but in world civilization, right? By the way, I, I grew up about maybe three or four hours north on the river from where Tom Sawyer and these books were set. And believe me, until reading these books, I didn't really realize how much your life this kind is, fishing and shooting and all this stuff all day, literally all day fishing. But anyway, one of the books my mother made me read was another of his, The Prince and the Pauper. I don't know if you know that one. Not quite as famous as Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn. But she had me read this when I was really little, seven or eight, and there was a nice picture on it. And there was a picture of a, of a pauper dressed like a pauper. And then there was a picture of a prince dressed like a prince. And it looks like exactly the same guy except different clothes. And you go, wait a second, what's this book about? So the prince and the pauper appears to be based on the archetype of Jesus here. To use Jung's, the psychologist Jung's phrase, archetype. Let's see Jesus the King, God the Son, as he really appears to those in kingdom vision. As he really appears to those in kingdom vision. Point one, the transfiguration. Please read verses two and three with me. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, those three, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, transformed. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white as no one on earth could bleach them. Oh, that's the end. I'm sorry. I wanted to keep going, but that is where we're supposed to stop. Sorry about that. Most scholars think the mountain here is Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon. It's not conclusive, though. Nobody knows for sure. In ages past, many people thought Mount Tabor. Mount Hermon, by the way, is over 9,000 feet tall. But Mount Tabor is only about 1,800 feet tall. So this is kind of the difference between a high mountain and a, and a, a high hill. If I was Peter, James, and John, I sure would have preferred to climb Mount Tabor, the shorter one, than Mount Hermon with Jesus. I'd have said, please, Jesus, let it be Mount Tabor, because I would not have made it to the top of Mount Hermon. I would have doubled over around 5,000 feet and asked Jesus and the guys just to leave me there, just leave me. Nonetheless, it looks like they climbed Mount Hermon over 9,000 feet. That is a lot of climbing, ladies and gentlemen, and the air is thin up there. In any case, whichever mountain they climbed, Peter, James, and John, and of course Jesus, reached their destination near the top, and then Jesus was transfigured before them. Luke adds that this happens as Jesus was praying. It's pretty amazing to think about, isn't it? Light. You know, you saw the stuff about the garments there, the clothing. Light, pure light coming from inside Jesus to the outside. We're used to seeing light come from the outside onto someone or something. Like, like the spotlight, the spotlight on a performer. That's from the outside. Or like an animal basking in the sun. That's from the outside. Here the light is coming from inside Jesus. 
It is the glory of Jesus Christ. It is his divine person when it is not covered by the raiment extending from his humanness. Some scholars like to say this is Jesus without the veil. I think that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I prefer to say this is Jesus as he is seen in his kingdom glory. This is Jesus as he is seen in his kingdom glory. Jesus seen not just through physical eyes, but seen through physical eyes and spiritual eyes. This is Jesus as he is in his kingdom glory, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Why does Jesus appear like this now? I mean, did you consider that, Carol? Did you consider that? Why doesn't Jesus just walk around like this all the time? Or why doesn't Jesus walk around like this half the time or a quarter of the time? Or when he's going to work? You know how you put your outfit on, your uniform to go to work? Why doesn't he, why doesn't he do this when he's going to work, when he's doing ministry? Like when he is, like a, like a priest wears a robe or something. Why doesn't he put, put on this appearance then? Why does he transfigure at this point in time? Six complete days prior, six complete days, Luke says eight days, including the two on the end, the two on which things happened, Peter confessed that Jesus is the Christ. So a week ago, Peter confessed that Jesus is the Christ. Do you remember this? Who do men say that I am? Some say that you are Elijah or one of the prophets. But then Jesus says to his disciples, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And on this rock, I say you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. That happened Six days. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Right? You are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It wasn't that very long ago in Mark 8 and Matthew 16 for us. That was a week, though, in their time. Roughly. After that, Jesus taught the disciples that he must suffer, die, and rise, that he must go to the cross. So why does Jesus transfigure at this point? He's building his church. He's now building his church. He has told the disciples what the plan is, and now he's building his church. He's continuing to edify Peter, James, and John and teach them more comprehensively who he is. He's building them up. He's inspiring them. He's encouraging them. He's growing them. They need it. They weren't that hot on this plan, remember, of going to the cross in the first place. Peter objected. Remember strongly, Peter objected. So he's inspiring them. He's building them up. They're getting a literal demonstration of what Jesus looks like and who he is, God the Son. I think we need that sometimes, some inspiration from the Lord when a situation is just too too hard to handle, right? If you've had some some type of illness in your family and then you get you get a word from God on it. That's very comforting. You needed that then. Imagine the pressure that these guys are under with the ministry on their shoulders. The church forged for eternity on the shoulders of these apostles and disciples in Christ, right? The foundation built on Christ and the apostles. They need this inspiration. They need it. They need inspiration to carry forth the mission for the church to be built. Jesus gives them the transfiguration. What about you? How are you inspired for ministry and missions? There's a great lesson here. Let the transfiguration of Jesus inspire you. You don't have to look, you don't have to look far 
You don't even have to look around at other people. You can, hopefully that will be inspiring. But you can look in the scriptures and see Jesus' transfiguration and be inspired for your ministry. Don't give way to fear or secular goals. Let the presence of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, inspire you. Fix your eyes on him even when you have to suffer in ministry as Peter, James, and John will have to suffer, right? They'll have to suffer. Eventually, Peter will have to be crucified upside down. Point two, Elijah and Moses. Let's read verse four. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. What's this about? Does this seem weird to anybody? First time you ever read this? I can't get anybody to raise their hand. Okay, Brian King, Ruth, raise your hand. Thank you. I got a few people. Not many. Less than 1%. Just so you know, less than 1% are willing to say this is strange. I know a lot of you, if you think about this, you just didn't want to raise your hand. This feels like a strange turn of events for these two just to show up, just to pop up. Imagine you're in your room or someplace praying with Jesus and two people show up out of nowhere. Now further imagine that they are relatives of yours, right? These are spiritual relatives of the guys. Now further imagine that they are relatives of yours, relatives that have died quite a long time ago. This would cause an epiphany in your outlook, beliefs, and worldview. Because one of two things is the case. Either you've gone completely mad... Or in the case of Peter, James, and John, you've been transferred into true kingdom vision by Jesus. Here's the key. These guys, Moses and Elijah, are living, not dead. Remember when Jesus uh, rebuked the Pharisees and said, you do err because God is the God of the living, referring to Abraham, these two guys are alive. So since you're seeing them, you're not seeing the natural world anymore. You're seeing into kingdom life. But why are they here? Why are these two guys in particular here? These two guys. Not four other guys or ten other guys. Why these two guys? They signify the law and the prophets in a tangible way. They signify the law and the prophets in a tangible way. The law and the prophets, which Jesus will fulfill by his cross and resurrection. You see, now the connection. He was just teaching them about the cross and the resurrection. They don't, they don't like it. Peter really doesn't like it. He objects strongly. They get the transfiguration. Now you bring these two guys in for further confidence, for further inspiration. Please turn to Luke 9.31. And this is what they talked about. That Luke's rendition gives us a little more information at this stage than does Mark. Who appeared in glory and spoke, that's what these guys are talking about, spoke of his departure. They're talking about the cross, the resurrection, maybe the ascension, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. The cross, the resurrection. They're talking about Jesus going to the cross and rising. This is further confirmation for Peter, James, and John that Peter's confession of Christ is right and that the plan that Jesus has laid out of going to the cross is right. You've got to realize, folks, I mean, we just, I mean, we just, we don't think enough this way today in America because we're so self-focused. We think everything starts and ends with us. I mean, honestly, even, even, even people who are not selfish these days still, because of all the crazy stuff around us, get this kind of view that things start and stop with us. You've got to realize, folks, this, these guys are not playing tiddlywinks. Peter, James, and John are playing for all the marbles as they accompany Jesus and establish the church. 
You don't have to worry about anybody going out, doing a good job, planning churches and stuff. Great. Praise God if you're called to be a church planner, not knocking it. But the church was established definitively 2,000 years ago. Peter, James, and John are out there. They're with Jesus. They're the part of the foundation on which the church is established. The disciples, these disciples, they need inspiration, confirmation, and confidence. That's what Jesus is giving them. He's giving them a direct injection. It's like uh, it's like going it's like going to the going to the hospital and you've got the and you've got a bad disease. I won't name it. And you've got a bad disease, and they give you the injection of that those anti those antibodies. Get your hemoglobin going. Right? He's giving them a direct injection. And that's also, by the way, if you'll pause and think about God's word, that's what Jesus is giving you today through his word. Whatever challenges you face in ministry or life, the transfigured Lord, Jesus Christ, God the Son, will meet your need. Just imagine Moses and Elijah. They behold God's glory. They beheld it. Moses, remember Moses at Mount Sinai in Exodus 31. And Elijah at Mount Horeb in 1 Kings. Now with Peter, James, and John, they behold the glory of God the Son on top of the mountain. God always sends the perfect messengers at the perfect time. Okay, point three, Peter's response. Let's keep moving along here since we got four points. And Peter said to Jesus, Ravi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Peter is not thinking correctly. You see that last part? He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Peter is not thinking correctly. He's afraid. Fear distorts our thinking. He doesn't know what he's saying. Luke 9 actually says, in Luke's version, Luke 9 says, not knowing what he said. Peter said this, let us make the three tents, not knowing what he said. Peter doesn't get the situation. Uh, Some People just throw up your hands, their hands here and say, uh, I don't know what Peter's talking about. That's what a lot of expositors say. We don't know what he's talking about. He just he doesn't, he doesn't get it. It's Peter, you know. I think that's, that's a shallow way to look at the text. One thing I do see in the text is that Peter unwittingly lumps Jesus, Moses, and Elijah into the same category. He unwittingly lumps them into the three of them, into the same category. He wants to build three tabernacles, one for each of them. To me, to me, this shows that Peter is drawing a mental equivalency between the three of them. Thinking of them in terms of parity, equality, parity. A mishkan in Hebrew a mishkan, a tabernacle, a tent, was used in the ancient Jewish economy as a place for worship. Therefore, the underlying assumption of Peter's remark is that there is not a distinction between Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, but that they are all great men, prophets, or teachers in the Jewish tradition who may now want to worship and be waited upon. Do you see? This is what Peter suggests. He'll build three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Then all three of you can worship and I will serve all three of you. Parody, you see? Understanding the meaning of Peter's suggestion is actually crucial, not optional, but crucial to understanding the next verse. For God the Father himself swiftly corrects Peter. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. 
right? If you don't understand this verse, then verse 7, this is my beloved son, listen to him, God's voice, seems like a non sequitur. Where is this coming from? No, it's a direct connect. It means a lot more than Peter stopped talking. It reveals starkly to the disciples that Jesus is not simply on par with Moses and Elijah. Jesus is not simply a man who engages in the religious practices of men. Rather, Jesus is God the Son. He's not to be lumped in with them and put on the level of parity with them this way. He's not simply a man who worships, but rather God the Son is to be worshipped and obeyed. What is majestically said by God the Father in verse 7, this is my beloved Son, listen to him, is the perfect answer to Peter's suggestion to build tabernacles in verses 5 and 6. Now this moves us to point 4, our last point. God the Father's voice, Jesus is our Lord. Please read verse 7 with me. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved Son, listen to him. This, in many ways, is the apex of the transfiguration. God the Father seals and defines the event with his divine voice and words. God the Father comes in his Shekinah glory and speaks the final pronouncement. What is the pronouncement? This is my beloved son. Listen to him. It is the language of command. It denotes that Jesus Christ is God the Son and he is to be listened to and obeyed. In fact, Jesus Christ is our Lord. So think about, think about Peter and James and John. Think about Peter. Just think about him. Just think about him as a human being for a second. As a Jew who grew up in Jewish traditions. This is part of what's going to allow him not to get stuck in the past of those Jewish traditions as the church is founded in Christ Jesus. That's that's what I think. It was astonishing that Peter, James, and John could be there at all in the presence of God's glory. This, too, is made possible in, by, and through Jesus. Please turn to Exodus 40, verse 34 and 35. This is another example of Shekinah glory, right? The same word is used there. See that cloud? Verse 34 of Exodus 40. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. But wait, it's different than what we see now. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Notice that Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it. Some questions then, understanding the implications of this. Do you really know that Jesus is God the Son, your Lord, that you always listen to? Or like Peter did at first, are you still thinking of Jesus only as a great prophet or teacher, someone whose advice is to be followed when it makes sense to you, when it suits you. See, this is a little sidebar. See, that's the difference between thinking of Jesus as your Lord or something else. When Jesus is your Lord, you follow him when he tells you to do something. When Jesus is something other than your Lord, if he's, if he's a, 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 great, a great man, a teacher, or, 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 or some other lesser thing in your mind than Lord and God the Son, then you might follow it when it suits you. Well, you know, you might also follow the National Enquirer when it suits you. You might also follow, uh, follow some other publication or some other teaching when it suits you. That doesn't mean anything, right? Jesus is Lord. We follow him all the time no matter what. 
So Peter did not understand. He wasn't thinking of him as God the Son. But God the Father, in his Shekinah glory, said, Listen, perhaps you can ask yourself, Has Jesus been transfigured in your mind from great man to God the Son? Furthermore, do you yet recognize that Jesus Christ is your bridge to God the Father? That's another thing that you can see in our passage in Mark. This too, Peter, James, and John should have learned when God the Father spoke to them from in his Shekinah glory, from out of the cloud. Right? Because of Jesus, they could be there. They could be there. It was a different, it was a different case than here in Exodus 40. My main question to you today is this. Do you see God the Son as he really is? Do you see God the Son as he really is? The transfiguration points the disciples through the cross to the resurrection and Christ's return. Are you oriented the same way? Do you keep your eyes on Jesus, God the Son, at all times and listen to him? He not only died for your sins, he rose. Let's read Hebrews 1, 1 to 3, and then we'll close. Please turn there. This goes along with my main question to you, which is also the title of the sermon embedded in there. Do you see God the Son as he really is? Verse 1 of Hebrews 1. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Elijah, right? Moses, Moses. Elijah, Moses, and many others. God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Now, what we just wit witnessed in the transfiguration, you can see it in the first part of verse 3. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Do you see God the Son as he really is? He is the radiance of of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. May your kingdom vision of Jesus Christ be transformed. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your mercy. Lord, we're amazed that Peter, James, and John could see, could, could literally see the transformed, the transfigured Christ. We're amazed that Elijah and Moses showed up alive, signifying the law and the prophets. Remember what John 1 says? The law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Lord, all of these things settle into our hearts and minds as we look at these verses. But then God comes in his Shekinah glory and speaks out from the cloud and says, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. This is the command immemorial for the church through the ages, 
now and forever. As the church stands on Christ and his words, the church will stand no matter what comes at it, either here or in this country or globally. Lord, help us to see Jesus Christ as he really is. Thank you, Lord, for inspiring us, giving us confidence, and taking away our fear. We are not to fear man. We thank you for these things, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.